directors of those as they moderate today's program. I know many of you are unacquainted with the Woodrow Wilson Center. I think it's important for you to know that it was established by Congress in 1968 as the living memorial to the only president who earned a PhD. You may not know that Wilson was a major political scientist. Some of his work is still used in classrooms today. He was the president of Princeton, and then he decided to leave for greener fields, or if perhaps not as green, and go into politics. So what the center does is we try to bring together the two parts of his life, the scholarly and the political, bringing policymakers together with scholars to talk about matters that are of interest to both. The center is insistently nonpartisan. The center itself never takes a stand on an issue. It is a neutral form for discussion. And that is particularly important in the context of today's program on interrogation techniques in the age of terror. But it is also particularly important in the light of something very unpleasant that is happening right now. As most of you undoubtedly know, our colleague and very dear friend, Hala Esfandiari, the director of the Middle East program here, is in prison in Iran. Presumably, we're not 100% sure about this, presumably charged with using the center to try and undermine the government of Iran and charged with uh, spying. The charges could not be more inaccurate or, if you'll forgive my use of the term, obscene. And we hope that you will join us in making a very strong statement to the people in Iran who have caught her up in some kind of political situation that is in no way of her making. We miss her and we very much want her back here. Now let me tell you about how we're going to run this morning's program. We are going to be looking first at the question from the point of view of the government. What are the various opinions in the government? What process has the government gone through in deciding what is acceptable, what is not acceptable, what's useful, what's not useful? That's the first panel, and you will have time for Q&A after our speakers are finished. We'll then take a short break, and the second panel will focus more on the view from outside the government and will bring to the discussion a comparative perspective from the perspective of Latin America, from the perspective of England and, and Ireland. We're not going to introduce the speakers at any length because you have those blue sheets that I hope you picked up outside <coughs> which give you a little bit about each speaker. There was no way we could get into a paragraph all of the information about these very distinguished speakers, but hopefully that will give you a sense of with whom you are having the pleasure this morning. And the only last thing that I would say to you is please turn off your cell phones. I, that's really something we, <laughs> right, okay, I see people reaching into their pockets. Thank you for doing that, and I'm now going to turn the podium over to Rob Litwack. Good morning, and let me uh, join Philip Strum in welcoming you all to the center for uh, this morning's uh, uh, conference on this important and timely topic. Panel one, as uh, Flip uh, mentioned, will focus on the, the, uh, this issue from the perspective of inside the U.S. government. Uh, we're fortunate to have with us today a, a distinguished panel, two members of which have had extensive experience in government, uh, and the third uh, in covering it for uh, a major publication. I should mention that in addition to the speakers here, we did invite a representative from the Department of Defense to uh, participate in today's proceedings, and uh, due to scheduling problems, uh, the individuals we approached were unable to participate today, but we did reach out to the Department of Defense. Uh, the panelists will each speak for 15 minutes. We'll, that will leave plenty of time for discussion and comments from the floor. Uh, we will go in the order as uh, advertised on the, the program. Our first speaker will be William Taft, who's an attorney at uh, Fried Frank Harris Shriver and Jacobson, and he's former legal advisor 
in the U.S. Department of State. Uh, as as uh, Philippa mentioned, uh, we have the bio statement, so we're going to keep it really abbreviated in terms of the introductions. Uh, uh, Mr. <coughs> Taft will be followed by Seth Stern, who's the legal affairs reporter at the Congressional Quarterly, and then finally David Rifkin, currently an attorney with Baker Hostetler, uh, uh, and a former legal advisor to the Council of the President will uh, be our concluding speaker, and then we'll open it up. Each will speak for about 15 minutes, so why well, we should have about uh, roughly half of this panel devoted to uh, discussion and uh, and comments uh, from the floor, but also between between the, the, the panelists, and we'll break at uh, 10:45 uh, as scheduled. So, with that brief introduction, it's my pleasure to uh, turn the floor over to our first speaker, William Taft. Thank you very much. I uh, <clears throat> uh, basically would like to break my presentation into two parts. The first, so to cover both of the subjects that have been advertised for this panel. Uh, first, the question of what uh, the law is with regard to uh, torture, at least as it applies uh, to the United States and the United States government. And uh, <clears throat> then secondly, the question of the efficacy uh, of uh, coercive interrogation techniques, uh, which could be torture or could be something uh, different. Um, so those two uh, parts, which have been advertised in the, uh, in the, the uh, run-up. Regarding the uh, lawfulness of using coercive techniques, uh, in interrogation in wartime. Uh, the, uh, it is now settled uh, that uh, at least two uh, provisions uh, apply. Uh, that one is the Convention Against Torture, uh, which uh, <clears throat> the United States joined uh, some years ago after careful consideration of the uh, very difficult, some of the very difficult issues involved uh, in that subject. Uh, and uh, the second is Common Article 3 of the Geneva Conventions, which of course the Supreme Court uh, found applied uh, to the uh, uh, people that we have taken into custody in the war that the terrorists have declared against us and the conflict which is ongoing. Uh, with those terrorist organizations. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, uh, Convention Against Torture, of course, uh, uh, bans uh, all uh, things that are torture. There is an issue uh, as to whether it uh, applies to actions by the U.S. government outside of the United States because of a, uh, uh, a discussion and some uh, uh, a, uh, some people have pointed to the fact that uh, it is limited to the uh, uh, torture is limited to what is prohibited by the uh, Constitution, and the Constitution doesn't apply outside of the United States to aliens. Uh, but uh, I think that that's uh, not a, uh, a significant uh, uh, position. And uh, the con most of the parties, I think, in fact, all except us, uh, would say that uh, the convention does apply uh, uh, everywhere uh, to the action of U.S. government, and I think that has been the government's position uh, generally, uh, notwithstanding this argument. Uh, there is also, of course, the question that has often been raised about the, the uh, whether the torture is prohibited uh, under the uh, convention Against Torture in a case of a ticking time bomb uh, where you want to find out uh, where the bomb is and uh, de uh, disarm it uh, from somebody who presumably knows and could you torture such a person. Uh, I think that the answer to that is that uh, you, the Convention Against Torture does not have any exception for that. Uh, it simply doesn't. That issue is not a new issue, uh, and it was before the Congress uh, and the government when it signed up to the Convention Against Torture, and that exception simply is not there. Uh, the uh, Common Article 3 
uh, is a little more uh, uh, extensive in that, uh, of course, it sets the minimal standard for treatment. It bans cruel treatment. It also bans torture of uh, persons in your custody. And it also prohibits humiliating and degrading uh, treatment. Uh, the uh, uh, question of the definitions, of course, of what is torture and what is humiliating and degrading treatment and what is cruel uh, need to be uh, identified and, and uh, elaborated on. Uh, and uh, uh, as was, I think, uh, known in, in the uh, run-up to the discussion of the uh, Military Commissions Act uh, last year, uh, there was an assertion on the part of the uh, government uh, in seeking to decriminalize violations of Common Article Three that this was too vague uh, a standard of what was humiliating and degrading too subjective. I uh, don't think that that is a fair criticism in that, at least in as much as until then, uh, the uh, government had taken the position uh, in the Army Field Manual uh, <clears throat> that uh, as to what could be done and what couldn't be done, what was humiliating and what was degrading. And also, over the years, the United States has not had a great deal of difficulty in identifying humiliating and degrading treatment when our own soldiers uh, have been subjected to it. Uh, it may be that for a criminal statute uh, that it was too vague, but I think uh, basically that the Army Field Manual sets out uh, the, uh, uh, a, a pretty good and has set out a, a pretty good uh, set of guidelines as to what is permitted and what is not permitted as a coercive uh, technique uh, of interrogation uh, for people detained in the, in the law, uh, under the law of war. Um, moving to the question of efficacy of torture, um, I was last week, uh, unfortunately, a, uh, one of these uh, temporary caps on my tooth came off and uh, the man made a quick repair because the permanent one wasn't ready yet and uh, it brought home to me when he squirted some of air upon the nerve that at least as far as I was concerned uh, there were things that I would be glad to tell him uh, <laughs> if he would stop doing that which uh, I wouldn't perhaps tell him uh, if he weren't doing it. Uh, so uh, there, is a, there, there is, at least for me, uh, some sense that coercion, uh, at least on me, uh, is effective to uh, elicit uh, information uh, that I would not otherwise uh, share. Um, but uh, it's also obviously true that the uh, use of coercion uh, and uh, torture certainly is, uh, is an extreme form uh, of, to of coercion, uh, is uh, going to be highly, uh, the effectiveness of it is going to be highly dependent on the individual whom you're dealing with, uh, on the, what he actually does know uh, or doesn't know, uh, and uh, the uh, uh, information that, that uh, you're trying to, uh, to elicit from him. There are uh, uh, situations, I, I know, uh, where there are some people, uh, certainly in not, not taking any, any modern uh, instances, and perhaps uh, there are more sophisticated techniques available, uh, but uh, I recall reading at least about uh, Jesuits in the 16th and 17th century uh, who suffered the most excruciating uh, uh, pain uh, and never uh, recanted or spilled the beans or whatever they were being, it was hoped that they would do. And I'm sure that there are people uh, of that sort where simply torture uh, of the worst kind and coercion will not work. Uh, there are other people who give in immediately. Uh, certainly, I remember in, the, uh, in Bernard Shaw's play, St. Joan, uh, she says, uh, I will be, uh, I'll tell you whatever you want uh, when I'm being tortured, and then as soon as you stop, I'll tell you the opposite. Uh, and this was, of course, again, a, a declaration of faith rather than a, a providing of information. Uh, but uh, 
I, I mention these simply to uh, identify the, the importance of the individual that you're dealing with and the high variability of the effectiveness of coercive techniques. Uh, the fact that the law does ban uh, coercive techniques, or certain coercive techniques, and the fact that the Army Field Manual, again, uh, has uh, been, uh, over the years, uh, establishing uh, the use of certain methods of interrogation uh, which do not come to the level of coercion, uh, things like deception, telling somebody that you know things that you don't know or you're not sure about, uh, pretending to be their friend, pretending to be annoyed with them, uh, all sorts of techniques that are actually outlined there which have proven to be effective uh, over the years. Uh, and the fact that the law does uh, prohibit uh, coercion does suggest that there is a, uh, a uh, general feeling uh, that... Uh, torture and coercive methods are not effective, and in fact the Army Field Manual says as much in its preamble uh, that uh, it is believed that uh, coercive methods are less effective in, in uh, obtaining uh, important information from people in custody uh, than the other methods which it uh, suggests should be used. Uh, the, a problem is, obviously, that you can't do it both ways for uh, both uh, for a single individual. Uh, you don't. You can never know what you would have gotten out of somebody if you had tortured them when you don't, or had used a coercive method when you didn't, uh, or what you would have gotten out of them if you'd not used such a method if you have. Uh, and uh, so I uh, uh, leave the the, the question uh, that way. Um, and uh, uh, perhaps our other panelists will have some more uh, information uh, on this. I, I, I don't doubt that there are certainly some people who uh, have information uh, that will, as I sa said about the dentist share, uh, will share it. There are some who will share false information. There will some who have no information to share. Uh, and uh, how we uh, deal with that uh, is uh, something that we did resolve uh, under the Geneva Conventions, under the, uh, uh, under the uh, uh, Army Field Manual guidelines. Uh, my own preference would have been to leave it where it was and not uh, look to new methods. Thank you very much. Um, turn now to Seth Stern. I thought I would focus on sort of the, uh, the legislation and the politics of the issue the last couple of years. Uh, I'm going to go back to 2005 uh, in the wake of revelations <clears throat> about ill treatment of prisoners at Guantanamo Bay, the, the naval base at Guantanamo Bay where the U.S. has had hot detainees in the war on terror, uh, and at Abu Ghraib, the prison in Iraq, all the pictures that were released of soldiers mistreating prisoners there, revelations about memos released by uh, attorneys within the government justifying various forms of interrogation and ill treatment. There was a real pressure that built uh, to examine the issue in Congress. And the debate was on, it became a debate on whether the U.S. should torture, but really what was at issue in the legislation was whether it was the lesser forms of coercive interrogations, cruel and human and degrading treatment. Uh, and what happened is in December 2005, there was uh, language added to the defense authorization and defense appropriation bills. And uh, there were two elements there. The first was uh, prohibiting the cruel and human and degrading treatment as defined by the 5th, 8th, and 14th Amendments. And that applied to all, uh, all U.S. personnel, whether military, CIA, whatever agency they were affiliated with. The second element said that the military, but not uh, CIA interrogators, were bound by the Army Field Manual. And the Army Field Manual lays out individual techniques, um, interrogation techniques. And so those were the two elements. Uh, the, the key player there was John McCain. He was the for most forceful advocate, and he has a unique sort of moral authority on this in Congress. He was a prisoner of war. 
He was subject to torture during his time uh, captured in North Vietnam. So really, he has a unique um, moral authority. The language was attached to those bills. It was, uh, despite resistance, it was uh, enacted into law. And so that's where it stood into 2006. What happened in 2006, though, was the Supreme Court in its June 2006 decision in Hamden uh, said that the tribunals, the, the system for, for trying the detainees at Guantanamo Bay, violated U.S. law. So the administration was faced with the need to rewrite the, the rules, rewrite the legislation regarding the, how to try the detainees. So in September of 2006, the president um, went before the public, and what was really a masterful uh, performance. I'm not, I'm not saying that. I think just you could objectively say that he handled it extraordinarily well. He comes before the public and he, he says, he acknowledges the existence of the secret CIA detention facilities. They had been reported on in the press. The Washington Post uh, had talked about these facilities possibly in Eastern Europe. The government hadn't acknowledged, the U.S. government hadn't acknowledged their existence. He says, we've had these, these secret CIA facilities. I'm acknowledging them. These were extraordinarily valuable in obtaining actionable intelligence that helps us prevent attacks. Um, and we're, we're using uh, aggressive interrogation techniques in these facilities. But the second part is he said, we are transferring custody of some of our highest uh, high value detainees who we've, who've interrogated, gotten everything we can from them. We're going to transfer them to military custody at Guantanamo Bay. And these are, they included uh, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, I believe, and, and these were high value targets. These are people who the president said were responsible for the terror attacks, and we're going to give them to the military. But he said, we, if you want to see justice for the victims of 9 11, we need to rewrite the rules and, and enact rules that will allow us to try these detainees at Guantanamo Bay. So it was a, a very good way he, he sort of linked the need for coercive uh, interrogation methods to the need for uh, a, a system to try these detainees once they were through. So this is six weeks or so before the election. Uh, he submits, a, uh, the, his allies in Congress take his language, they submit a bill. The Republicans largely are behind him, but then he runs into a problem, the president, the Bush administration. It's a trio of three Republicans in the Senate. Uh, John McCain, John Warner of Virginia, who's the chairman, who was the chairman of the Senate Armed Services Committee, and the third is Lindsey Graham, a senator from South Carolina. Now, these three have unique uh, credentials, military credentials. Warner was the Secretary of the Navy. McCain was a POW. Lindsey Graham is a, uh, a judge advocate general in, I believe, the Air Force Reserve. So th this trio speaks with real authority. And they said, hold on a minute. We are very concerned with some of these provisions. The provisions that says the, uh, if we adhere to the, the language in the 2005 law, the Detainee Treatment Act, that that satisfies the United States obligations under common Article 3. They are also very concerned about provisions allowing, uh, that would block the detainees or their lawyers to see secret evidence. Uh, that would allow some coerced testimony and hearsay evidence. So they had real concerns. What was interesting is that the Democrats, at six weeks or so before the election, they essentially completely just back away. They're going to let, they essentially let the Republicans fight this one out among themselves. I think they made a calculation. Things are looking good. Or we, we have a good shot at the majority. We're not going to jump in this fight. Let the Republicans duke it out. Seemed to be the calculation. And so what happened was you had a negotiation between the, the Bush administration, that trio of, of Republican senators. They came up with a bill. Uh, it was the, the Military Commissions Act eventually uh, voted on and enacted. Uh, it, it, it gave, the president had to give some of what he wanted, but largely got the provisions he wanted uh, and so that's, that's where it stood. The Democrats, they, there, was, there were cries, they, they were outraged, um, particularly about a provision that uh, sort of eliminated habeas corpus review of 
of uh, your designation as an enemy combatant or your detention. Uh, but it went through. They didn't put up that much of a fight. And now we're in 2007. The Democrats control Congress. And, and so the question is, what, if anything, is going to change regarding the provisions related to the uh, interrogation of prisoners uh, or their ability to challenge their in interrogations or detention? And so far, it looks like not a whole lot's going to happen. Um, the Democrat, I mean, there's certain realities. One is everything in this Congress, the Democrats need 60 votes in the Senate. They need a, a filibuster-proof filibuster majority. They don't have that. So to do anything, they need to attract some Republicans. And the other factor is that some of the Democrats that got elected are pretty conservative. And so they're not necessarily going to go along with uh, some of the proposals. We've seen a couple things so far. Uh, one proposal relatively narrow by Senators Specter uh, and Senator Leahy, who's the chairman now, the Democratic chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee. They have a bill pretty narrow that would address the habeas corpus, the ability to challenge your detention if you're a detainee in U.S. courts. That's going to actually be taken up by the Senate Judiciary Committee tomorrow. And uh, the Majority Leader Harry Reid has promised that that'll be considered on the Senate floor. But again, they need 60 votes, which it's not clear they're going to get. There's a broader measure by Senator Dodd of uh, Connecticut that would also uh, bar all coercive uh, evidence, it would, uh, it's, a, it's a broader measure. That one has gotten even less support so far. It's really just sort of sitting out there. The two places where you've seen action so far, uh, it's not encouraging for those who want any sort of change on the House defense authorization bill uh, that was passed last month. Uh, they, they ignored, well, they didn't take up amendments that would have closed Guantanamo or restored the habeas corpus rights, there was a realization that those might have synced the bill. They did include language that directs the Pentagon to report on the detainees, and, and the, the, that prompted a veto threat from the president. And uh, the other thing happening is on the Senate Defense Authorization Bill. The chairman there, uh, Chairman Levin of Michigan, a Democrat, he's included language uh, that would require detainees to receive legal representation also uh, bar the use of statements obtained through um, cruel and human uh, treatment of detainees. So that's sort of where it stands now. It doesn't look uh, particularly like the Democrats have the sort of votes they would need to, to scale back the 2005 and 2006 laws at this point. Um, thank you. I will uh, go through uh, essentially the same issues that uh, Seth and, uh, and Will have descri de described so far, which is the law, a little bit about legislative stuff, and then some policy issues. Let me uh, say at the outset that these are tough issues. Uh, it's always tough to balance liberty and order, even in peacetime. Balancing it in wartime is the most difficult task, and uh, certain aspects of wartime policies, like, like interrogations, are hard from an emotional, psychological level to, to address. We've, Great thing about civilization, we all got kinder and gentler and more genteel about those issues. So I, I certainly agree at the outset that these are not pleasant issues about which to have discourse, but we do have to talk about it, if only to arrive at the at the right policy balance and satisfy ourselves as citizens um, that we are doing the right thing. Now, I largely agree as to the law with what uh, will my good friend and, and, and colleague will have to say with a couple of caveats. Um, I think that, well, first, of all due respect, the Supreme Court did not, repeat, did not definitively establish that common right free applies for all purposes uh, and binds the United States government in that way. Not only that's not what the decision said, but the Supreme Court, I would submit to you, given the fairly narrow ways in which judicial power operates in our constitutional system cannot issue such sweeping pronouncements anyway. What the Supreme Court actually has decided and hum done is that common article free applies by virtue to this particular set of issues before it, namely the legality of the pre-MCA military commissions proposed by the President by virtue of uh, a very tidy trick, namely that Congress in its infinite wisdom incorporated legislatively by reference, um, Blackberry's 
Sorry about that. I am not a technology uh, uh, expert here. Thank you. Uh, the Supreme Court, sorry, <clears throat> that common article. It's not me. Turn mine too. <laughs> uh, unintended consequences. But, but anyway, that uh, Congress incorporated into something called UCMJ, which is kind of an omnibus legislation that deals with many issues of military discipline and order and, and followed sort of an earlier version of things called the Article of War. But Congress did incorporate, by a very obscure reference, the common Article 3. It didn't do any more than that. In, in, in particular, for example, it didn't even address the question of whether or not Geneva Conventions of which common Article 3 is a part of self-executing. Moreover, it is not the province of a judiciary to make sort of broad and sweeping statements about what international law obligations mean for for the United States. Um, and that's kind of important. Administration, frankly, threw in the towel on this issue, and there's a perfectly defensible legal way, in my humble opinion, to read the Hamdan opinion differently. But it's an important, important nuance. Now, one other issue that I think Will and I don't disagree much on, but maybe a little bit, is how clear uh, words like torture like cruel and human and degrading as a matter of law and, he, and, and other language in, in common article three which refers to humiliation. I happen to think that they're very capacious. Um, doesn't mean they're completely devoid of meaning, but they're certainly not crystal clear, certainly not in the context of criminal law enforcement where you have to worry about such things as void for vagueness. To state the obvious in our constitutional system, you don't want to subject people to, to penal penalties but clearly telling them at the outset what are acceptable parameters of conduct as if I'm no due process problem and equal protection problem and many other, many other problems. Now, some of those words are, are pretty clear, um, others less so. I think <coughs> what torture is is, is more or less clear. Uh, I think that um, what is CID is less clear. What, with all due respect to those who claim otherwise, what humiliation means is utterly unclear because I would submit to you, ladies and gentlemen, this is extremely culturally context-driven. There are cultures where, because of you know, a fairly demeaning view of women, men find it humiliating to work for women and certainly find it humiliating to be interrogated by women. And in those cultures, being interrogated by a woman or somebody, let's say, of Jewish faith is extremely humiliating. I tend to doubt that most of you would feel that that is... The, the, these sentiments probably genuinely felt by the individuals who uh, espouse these views should be, you know, should be uh, uh, indulged, if you will. If you were, if we were, you know, interrogating a, a neo-Nazi individual who had a fanatical hatred of Jews, would, is that the fact that we should remove everybody who is interrogating him, no matter how pleasantly and, and, and gently, uh, who looks Jewish or in fact is Jewish? That, so humiliation is very, very culturally driven. A couple of other things I, I frankly, and not only culturally driven, by context driven. Now, one of my favorite points when I have such chats is to point out to people the fundamental differences between civilian and military life. What do I mean by that? If I go back to my office and I'm you know, uh, angry at my secretary or one of my more junior associates in my law firm, if I told either of them to drop down and give me 50 push-ups, I would be in trouble with my law firm. In military life, when you go for basic and advanced training, you do well. Things have gotten a little kinder and gentler. The, the real surgeons are not as tough and sadistic sounding, but people still do uh, uh, stand and parade rest for a couple of hours with in full kit, uh, which is, by the way, standing at parade rest is a form of, of, uh, uh, of stress position. People give you 100 push-ups or however many it's done. People are being put through you know, run with, again, a full gear that, uh, that is quite unpleasant and debilitating. And then you have such nice things as being yelled at and, and screamed and being told to go scrub the, the floor with your toothbrush. Because the whole essence of military life is humiliating and degrading people, stripping away the soft layers of, of civilian identity and recasting them as warriors. Now, um, I don't think many experts in military psychology and training would disagree with that. And, that, and you know... Many more unpleasant things happen in hell week, sleep deprivation, very bad nutrition, and if you go through more advanced training, uh, you know, for pilots or SEALs, where things get done that, frankly, uh, uh, I don't think we've done to the detainees, including the fact that some people were waterboarded. 
uh, again, to build up, not for any sadistic purposes, but to build the resistance to anticipated use of these techniques by our enemies. So to me, if you're serious about looking at this, you have to understand the fundamental differences between civilian and military sphere, and the fact that so everything in, in areas like humiliation, everything is context and culture specific. Incidentally, I happen to think, thank God I never gone for one, but being in a custodial interrogation situation is inherently unpleasant and humiliating, even if it's a good cop, bad cop routine. You know, you read stories about, you know, tough interrogators pressing folks, not very sympathetic folks, and all the Nan Ron and saying, look, unless you cooperate, we're going to really nail your wife and she'll be in prison for the next 15 years, but if you cooperate, we're going to cut her a deal and she's only going to go, you know, and, and do six years. I cannot imagine that that would not be extremely painful and, and, and very cruel from a perspective of an individual who is undergoing that. Now, uh, Will is right that the old manual has not had any discernible forms of coercion. That was a policy choice that the United States made. I, I see no evidence that that choice was made as a matter of law, which is to say having analyzed the relevant legal strictures, international and domestic. Uh, frankly, we were not very serious about unlawful combatants as a category. doesn't mean that uh, we have given up the right to uh, engage in a conduct that's not prohibited because international law, in my opinion, changes rubber glacially, and, and you need to have more than an absence of practice. You need to have a what lawyers call opinion juries, which is a strong and, and concerted practice on the other side backed up by an indication that that is something that's legally compelled. But all, all of it, what it means is that following World War II and up until September 11, we're really not serious about dealing with, with uh, these set of issues. One other point about law, um, there is such a category called lawful versus unlawful combatants. Lawful combatants, of course, are honorable people upon capture should be treated with every dignity because all they've done is fought for their country or their cause and happened to suffer the misfortune of being caught. They're entitled to the gold standard. They cannot suffer any humiliation. They cannot suffer any inducement to betray secrets, you know, a famous rank, you know, serial number, et cetera, et cetera. They cannot have an offer of oranges to obtain information. So no disadvantageous treatment of any kind. The unlawful combatants, of course, have to be treated humanely. They cannot be tortured. They cannot be subjected to cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment. But you can interrogate them aggressively. The question, again, is what is aggression? Well, let me then briefly switch to some policy issues. The important thing to point out is, and again, I don't think that Seth or, or Will uh, would disagree with that, but I want to put it more crisply. Unfortunately, the critics have always used the T word, torture, in describing everything. And, and there are many unpleasant things that are not torture. Okay? There, again, uh, just as a matter of law, forget law, people wouldn't have used words like cruel, humane, degrading, humiliating if, if everything was torture. But there are many things other than torture. And again, the use of the word torture, in my opinion, has been so cheapened in the sense that everything is torture and nothing is torture. And I read statements by some of our European friends which say that the, the very fact that we have people detained in Gitmo, and it's a somewhat different, different debate, but just to give you an idea, the very fact that they've been detained indefinitely, meaning what, without knowing how long they're going to be there, is a form of torture. Well, with due respect, under that standard, every POW in every war has been tortured because I bet you if you ask German POW, you know, uh, in, in 1941 or 42, an American or British POW, you know, following the Battle of Dunkirk, if you asked Winston Churchill how long the war would last, he wouldn't have been able to tell you. Those things just are unknowable. So, and there's an enormous devaluation, in my opinion, of the word torture. Now, um, is coercion necessary? We hear that, you know, if we're just very clever, if we use the standard FBI techniques, if we appeal to people's good graces and talk about the fact that they're going to not see their families for a while, and if we get really into their psychological space, everything would be fine. I'm not an interrogator, never never been one, hope not to uh, partake in this admittedly tough and unpleasant activity, but I would tell you one thing. Um, first, the, the Washington Post, New York Times, and various other newspapers who hardly be accused of being sympathetic to the Bush administration did write a number of stories, you can Google it, in uh, describing that in, in late 2001, this is following our invasion of Afghanistan, 
Uh, we captured a number of Al Qaeda personnel in, in 2002. The FBI has been singularly unsuccessful in eliciting information out of detainees using the traditional FBI interrogation technique. So the whole reason the CIA is swung into action and the debate arose in the administration about what the definitional issues are is because the other stuff did not work. Now I've talked to some Israeli and British colleagues who tell me that if you're really clever, if you know the language, if you know the culture, you can pretty much get most of the stuff out of people slowly without any use of coercive techniques. Well, I'll be right, but the thing I would say to submit to you is we don't have that capability, certainly right now. We don't have many detainees who are expert in, uh, in the cultures of the regions from where most of the people we're fighting against come who are expert in that culture. So in some sense, it's, it's not an option. It reminds me of a debates in the good old Cold War days about defense procurement. So people would say, well, because, you know, we have waste, fraud, and mismanagement in the Defense Department of $900 toilet seats. We shouldn't spend any money on defense until we fix that. And, my answer at the time was, no, that's not how you do things. You try to minimize waste, fraud, and mismanagement, but in the interim, you spend your defense dollars as much as you as necessary to buy the defense forces you need. So there are undoubtedly some efficacious alternatives, but I, I do not know how easily they're obtainable right now in the foreseeable future. But at least it's a debatable proposition. What isn't a debatable proposition, ladies and gentlemen, is that stress techniques do not work. I mean, it is... I'm really tired of hearing that because if it were so, there would be no debate because then both the moral imperatives and the authoritarian imperatives would support the same proposition. No coercion. And in fact, the only reason you would have coercive techniques is because you're a sadistic bastard. And it would be very easy to ban it. It would be very easy to enforce it for a chain of command. Unfortunately, coercive techniques work with all the caveats that we'll mention. Yes, there's a small category of people who are so tough, so devout, so motivated that no matter what you do, you can pull them apart, literally, they wouldn't tell you anything. Very small category of people like that. And there's a, uh, some of you may remember the Diamond Man movie. Uh, if you don't know anything, no matter how much you're tortured, you wouldn't be able to tell anything. And uh, I remember that uh, Dustin Hoffman, after this sadistic uh, old Nazi type, drills every single tooth he had to find out where the diamonds are hidden. He says, I guess he really didn't know anything. But these are, these are exceptions. There are, I would say, and I don't know what statistical breakdown is, but there are some people who will talk upon being captured just because you can sort of overall them. There is a fairly small category, probably over here, a small category of people who would not talk no matter what you do to them. And in the, you know, here is the vast middle that people will talk with cursive techniques. Now, another sort of straw man I, I really am tired of hearing is that people would lie. Of course they would lie. People would lie if, if you capture people who don't like you and don't want to kill you and want to fight you or just not crazy about you. They would lie whether you interrogate them cursively or not. And unless you have an ability over time to cross-check what they tell you against what other people told you, what you know would be true and sort of refine mosaic-like the complete intelligence picture, then interrogating people is useless. But if you do have enough time, you have this opportunity to cross-reference things. The fact that somebody lies is not a problem. In fact, you can learn, once you figure out enough of a context, you can learn as much from the fact that somebody is lying to you as somebody is telling you the truth, as long as you're able to discern what's lying and what's true. The biggest problem for an interrogator, ladies and gentlemen, is people wouldn't talk at all. So, um, now, I don't know, frankly, and I don't think any one of us knows how much intelligence we've really gotten from people who were aggressively interrogated. But I would tell you again, um, the fact that the George Tenet, who certainly is not a big fan of his administration, mentions in his book uh, that there were some spectacular uh, intelligence coups where information was obtained for aggressive interrogation techniques. The fact that this has been mentioned by other people, including the president, at least I'm not inclined to assume that everything he says is, is, is erroneous. The fact that, as a general proposition uh, throughout history, aggressive interrogation techniques do work um, suggests that it, it is a point worth exploring. Let me mention two other things briefly, and I'll stop. One, I know there are people who chastise the administration for exercises like John Yu memo and various other things, and you may not like where he came out, or where I should say Office of Legal Counsel came out, Department of Justice came out, White House Counsels came out. Frankly, there are some aspects of those memos which I would not agree. But what I ask you to appreciate for a second is how commendable it is that we as a democracy, as a society, faced with certainly was felt as an extreme threat in the aftermath of September 11. I happen to think we still are facing the extreme threat, but it was more palpable at that time. 
we actually asked legal questions. We wanted to understand what is not just right, but what is legal. I would submit to you that most of other countries in the world, including some of our democratic friends in Europe, wouldn't have bothered asking legal questions. I, for example, doubt very much, and I know some of you may think I'm kicking the French gratuitously, but I doubt that the French Ministry of Defense or Intelligence Services obtain a legal opinion prior to having the agents blow up a rainbow warrior, which was a, uh, a ship protesting French nuclear tests in the Pacific, and said, no, why don't you write us a legal opinion about how do we make sure that nobody's on board, et cetera, et cetera, and you know, how do we avoid violating New Zealand law? They just don't do those things. They, the sense is that when you have something driven by raison d'etat, you do what you have to do. So we're not like where people came out, but I, I, I don't understand the sort of a the, the, the occasional giggle or, or condemnation of a very of a very effort to answer those issues. My bottom line view, very briefly, is this: the legal matrix is not the driver, because I think actually the, the laws, the Geneva Conventions, the torture conventions, various other things, actually allow us more than we should be comfortable with doing as a matter of policy. So it's not a legal straitjacket. It should be a policy-driven decision. And my last point is that what, what saddens me is that we have not, as a society, as a body polity, had a serious discussion about this in the last several years. We had a lot of sloganeering. We have a lot of, you know, courageous, and I'm being somewhat sarcastic because they don't have much <coughs> courage to condemn torture and cruel and humane degrading treatment and all forms of coercion is frankly career enhancing. It's, you know, if one wants to get confirmed by the Senate one of these days or many years down the road, it's far safer to condemn all of that stuff than defend even aspects of coercion. But I mean, we, we condemn this, we, we tweet things as if everything was torture, and, and we don't want to ask ourselves questions, are there degrees of coercion which would be comfortable in society? And I would submit to you that there should be at least some. I am personally, certainly not, supportive of torture or cruel and humane degrading treatment. But I find it difficult to imagine that we should not apply aggressive techniques of interrogation to unlawful enemy combatants that at least as aggressive as we use with regard to our own personnel. And that would include not many things. It's, it would not include waterboarding, but it would include things like sensory deprivation. It would include things like sleep deprivation, moderate amount, moderate use of stress positions. I don't understand that if we do it to our men and women who join up to, to, to wear a uniform, but we as a society find that is acceptable, but not uh, acceptable when we do it to the unlawful enemy combatants. And by the way, the notion that people volunteer here and not there is irrelevant because as a matter of law, you cannot volunteer for things that are uh, inherently legal and against public policy. You cannot volunteer for prostitution. You cannot volunteer for torture. You cannot volunteer for many reasons. It's very regrettable to me that we as a society have been unable at least to have a serious dialogue about it. Hopefully we'll do today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Before opening it up to the floor, I'm going to give our panelists an opportunity to respond uh, to uh, the presentations that they've heard by their uh, fellow panelists. Um, let me turn first to, to, to Will Taft. Uh, uh, David came up with a quite different take on the two key issues you focused on, legality and efficacy, and I was wondering if you wanted to uh, come back on that. Well, I'm uh, just briefly, I, I'm not sure that we are as far apart as, uh, as all that. Uh, the, uh, just on, on, first of all, on the, on the question of common Article 3 and its application to, uh, as a uh, regulating government conduct in the conflict that we're in, uh, I think uh, it would be a very uh, surprising development uh, should any, uh, should the uh, uh, any case that would to, were to go to the Supreme Court again, with the uh, would find uh, that uh, that was not applicable, and the precedent would be the Hamden case, where I, th I believe that is what they found, and it certainly after the Military Commissions Act was passed, that view was adopted essentially by the Congress uh, as well. Uh, that Common Article 3 applies. There is a question as to who gets to interpret what Common Article 3 means, and uh, there I, as an executive branch fellow over many years, uh, have tended to uh, uh, the view that a great deal of deference has to be given to the executive branch's interpretation of our international treaty obligations. Uh, and uh, it could be 
uh, that, uh, and the Military Commissions Act again anticipates this, that the, uh, that the President would come up with a reinterpretation of Common Article 3, or an, an, an interpretation which people might find controversial, let us just say. Uh, but I don't think that you would find him uh, walking away from the determination that Common Article 3 actually applies to the conduct of the government and needs to be respected. And of course, it's embedded in the Detainee Treatment Act uh, as well, the terms on humiliating uh, uh, and degrading uh, treatment. Again, leaving open what exactly that is. As to the question of the, uh, of, uh, the policy versus legal, I, I think I, I, uh, I agree with, with David that uh, uh, the Army Field Manual was largely, was a policy choice. Uh, but I don't think it's uh, that I don't think it's enough to simply say, and it was not legally required. Policy choices here are very important. They are the choices that we are asked to make, and they were the choices that the uh, government did make, adhered to for uh, 40 years uh, in uh, all of the conflicts that we were uh, uh, involved in uh, since the the, uh, the the manual was established. Uh, the manual was a little later than 40 years and was redone, but, uh, and is being redone now. Uh, but uh, those are the choices that we made, and I think it's fair to say that they were made after an analysis not so much of the law, as David says, as to what is required, but they were made after an analysis of what was in our interest uh, overall as a matter weighing both the effectiveness of our interrogations and other elements. Uh, of our policy as to what we wanted to be seen to be uh, our position in the world, how our own servicemen would be treated uh, when they were captured, what standard we should uh, be promoting for application in conflicts around the world as to interpreting these. These were the policy choices that were made, and I, I think that there was certainly an element of the question of the efficacy of uh, various techniques that went into it uh, in, uh, in there, and, and I think that uh, it, while uh, uh, it may be uh, <clears throat> that those choices were wrong, uh, there's, uh, they were the choices that we made, and I don't think that there was a great deal of, of uh, consideration uh, of those issues uh, in, in the large uh, when choices were made not to follow the Army Field Manual. Uh, it was not considered uh, as a large uh, question uh, of what would be the implications for our broader foreign policy and uh, security interests around the world and, and, uh, and so forth. It was actually a decision that was made uh, uh, by a very small group of people, generally kept uh, uh, secret. Uh, that it had been made, and uh, my impression certainly is that uh, a great many factors which should have been considered in reaching those decisions were not considered. Uh, that's. Uh, Can I follow up on that point? Because if I just want to want to want to say one one more thing, uh, I do uh, I do agree that there is uh, that you do run a risk in not using coercive measures. That, that there are important things out there that you could find out. Uh, war is, uh, is full of risks, and you weigh those risks against the benefits of whatever conduct you're, you're, you're doing. And it isn't uh, an absolute that getting uh, information from somebody uh, is the only uh, factor which you should be, uh, which you should be considering uh, in uh, deciding whether to use a particular coercive method or not. There are other other factors involved. Robert, can I just we run a risk? Ten, ten I'll, I'll go ahead. Uh, I'll let you respond, David. I just wanted to uh, add to the mix of considerations the distinctions between made between policy decision and legality. There's a sense this panel is focusing on uh, the debate within the U.S. government after 9/11. We tend to view the U.S. government as a unitary actor, but those of us not just living in Washington know that, it, that it's made up of different agencies with different equities that weigh in either on the policy side or on the legality side. Will you worked at the Department of State where there is State L, the legal office, that would weigh in on issues like uh, the Geneva Conventions? And I was wondering if you could give us some uh, sense of the flavor of the 
debate within the U.S. government where you had different agencies with powerful equities like the State Department on Geneva Conventions, like the Department of Defense, which was, uh, whose personnel were out in the field capturing people and needed guidance on how to handle them, et cetera, and then an executive uh, in the office, in the White House, uh, with a very uh, uh, robust interpretation of Article Two and, and the prerogatives that, that, that the executive had in dealing with these. So um, let me turn to David to answer, but I would like to, if, if you, if, if you Look, could. We'll hold that. Okay. <laughs> Bring that into <laughs> Sure. Okay. I, yeah. I know David Thank wants you. to get it. No, I, I, a couple <laughs> of things of all the differences between me and Will are indeed nuanced, but I appreciate uh, your uh, Robert's point because I, I think it's relevant. But let me say a couple of things. Uh, let's forget the legalistic debate about what the court said relative to how Article 3 applies or doesn't apply. It's interesting. We can talk about it in a question and answer period if people are interested. Clarify. I never suggested that the policy choices made in the aftermath of World War II on interrogation, course of interrogation techniques and broader sort of lawful versus unlawful combatant paradigm were wrong or quite reasonable. But the fundamental difference, ladies and gentlemen, between legal conclusions and policy-driven conclusions is that in a government of laws and not men, legal conclusions cannot be changed by a policy fiat, but policy ones can. So depending on which you think of the imperatives that drove policy before and, and arrived at a particular balance, it obviously tells you what you can do now. Point number one. Point number two, I actually agree with Will that I think the decisions have been handled quite badly as a matter of, of sort of institutional and bureaucratic politics. You did have did not have a serious debate within the administration uh, on the totality of those issues. But interrogation wasn't just the only issue. The overarching issue was, of course, whether or not Geneva Conventions apply. Now, this is an area where I think Will and I do fundamentally disagree because I think that the notion that Geneva Conventions apply to al-Qaeda or even the Taliban uh, is, to me, utterly inconsistent with uh, both the language of those conventions, but also the entire fabric of international humanitarian law or laws of war. The reason, ladies and gentlemen, it was a very important matrix is because forget the unpleasant coercive stuff. If you're a POW, that means, to me, it's a real gold standard. It means so many things that, for one thing, you cannot segregate people. If people in Gitmo are POWs, you cannot keep them apart. They need to be with their fellows. They should be able to congregate. They should be able not to, you know, reveal my age anymore when I should, but I, I remember watching at least the reruns of our Hogan's Heroes, and it's, of course, not a serious scholarly product, but it does con accurately convey the way prisons and war camps were being run. They elected their own representatives to deal with. Uh, in, in fact, to state the obvious, POWs are treated much better than criminal uh, sus well, not criminal suspects, individuals who are incarcerated in prison. They're honorable people. If we really had to apply... Geneva Convention across the board, long before you get to interrogation regime, you know, these guys would have been able to play, you know, to have hockey sticks and banjos. And this is famous business about that Gonzalez gets, you know, uh, slammed for the reference to the quaint provisions. I wouldn't have used the word quaint. I would have used words like ample. If you're a POW, you get a lot of provisions. If you want to be able to use musical instruments, use musical instruments. So we'd have people congregating in Guantanamo, you know, playing musical instruments and talking to each other. It wouldn't have, it would have been the same, same regime. The, the, the final point I wanted to make, let's be clear about what we have now. After all the great congressional process, which I think Seth accurately described, we have a new Army Field Manual, ladies and gentlemen, that basically enables people to do absolutely nothing except not even mutt and jeff routines. So we have unlawful enemy combatants who are treated better, better than muggers, and rapists or mug and rapist suspects, because at least there in many police stations you have, you know, bad cop, good cop, guy getting into your space, bad breath, spittle flying. We cannot do it under the new Army Field Manual. So we have reached a level of moral absolutism. We treat these people perfectly. And I would submit to you that the, the CIA rules when CIA interrogations finally come out, they'll be very close to that because it is inherently impossible in our bureaucratic and political culture to have one agency operate under the standards that are fundamentally different of ours. So without having a serious debate, by default, we've gotten ourselves to a position where nobody is going to be interrogated with any degree of coercion. And again, if you're a mugger who you know, grabbed a, a purse from a little old lady, you can be treated more aggressively than if you are Osama bin Laden. With all due respect, that's nuts. 
I would like to come back to this, uh, you know, question of uh, uh, legality and, and the Geneva Convention's applicability. But let me uh, turn to, to Seth to just uh, expand on his remarks. After the legislation was passed that you referred to, uh, there was the signing statement that the president made, which uh, ostensibly took it back. And uh, um, there's been th there's that aspect, and and what the gap is between the prerogatives that the president was asserting in that signing statement and the interpretation of the legislation, <coughs> the, the intent behind the legislation that McCain and Graham and, and Warner had signed on to. That, that's a, one issue. And then if you could just extrapolate from there to where we're at in terms of the intersection between sort of <coughs> policy and politics, this issue has come up in the uh, absurdly early uh, presidential debates we've had. And, and there was a, uh, in the row on the Republican side a week or so ago, and proposals to double you know, Guantanamo, et cetera. So if you could just sort of flesh out uh, your comments on that. Well, I, I don't think the president won many friends on Capitol Hill with these signing statements. They, members of Congress in both parties, I think, felt that he was sort of interfering with their prerogatives. Uh, and so I think that certainly when the issue returned in 2006, there was a certain skepticism and concern about whether they could even take the president uh, at, at his word or whether he was just going to write another signing statement and sort of just bypass whatever they had done legislatively. As far as the election, I, I think it is very interesting. We're in a, a very early start to the 2008 presidential campaign, and one of the, the leading Republican candidates is John McCain. Um, and John McCain has sort of absented himself from the U.S. Senate. Uh, he's become something of a non-entity. He's campaigning essentially full-time. And I think that's a problem for Democrats who, if they do want to move forward on this issue this year, they've lost sort of one of their, their most important voices in the Republican Party. Now, McCain has a problem that was highlighted in that, in that debate that uh, was referenced. Uh, the, the question a few weeks ago was uh, the, sort of the ticking time bomb scenario. The, the question was, what do you do? You've, there have been a couple of attacks. <coughs> You've got information that another one is forthcoming. You've captured detainees. You take them to Guantanamo. What do you do? And most of the Republican candidates, it was almost a competition for who could, you know, beat the hell out of the, the detainee the worst. Uh, you had uh, most of them saying, I would, I would do everything I could. Uh, one of the candidates uh, said, oh, I'd like to double Guantanamo. So it was really almost trying to outdo each other. McCain was, again, sort of a forth, forceful voice against torture. But on the other hand, I think he's got to realize that in a, in a race where he's got to prove his conservative credentials, advocating less coercive interrogation techniques isn't really going to get him very far. The same applies, though, on the, on the Democratic side. Um, I mean, you see Senator Dodd has introduced the most uh, comprehensive bill addressing the detention and, and and interrogation of detainees. But what's interesting is he's sort of a second or third tier candidate. The leading Democrats, Senators Barack Obama, Senator Hillary Clinton, neither of them have introduced legislation or have taken this as a, as a big issue. So clearly the leading Democrats do not see this as the road to uh, getting elected president in 2008. And on the Republican side, most of the candidates see more advantage in appearing tough than in, in uh, speaking out again on this issue. And as the only member of the panel who's sort of part of the media or sort of the communications uh, world, uh, maybe you could just comment on how uh, uh, the media has covered this and uh, uh, the impact of uh, t TV shows like 24 where it seemed to be both uh, legal and effective. Um. Well, I think the debate has, there's very little distinction in the debate. And you know, some human rights activists say there shouldn't be any between torture and the lesser forms of coercion and coercive interrogation, that it's all bad, it's all illegal, it's all, none of it's an option. But it's been sort of combined in that the debate in Congress was, should we be allowed to torture suspects, when what was really being debated wasn't torture at all. So there is that, act, that utter lack of nuance um, in the debate. The second factor, I think, a sh the show like 24 in particular, has just really, I think, influenced public opinion more than anything anyone in, in Congress has to say. Um, I think you get the sense watching that, this ticking time bomb scenario that faced with a catastrophic attack, 
if you let your CIA operative, Jack Bauer, you know, decapitate someone or whatever he does to force the other guy to talk, it seems to work. So I think that does fuel public perception. I'm not saying one way or the other whether it works, but I think it, it feeds a perception that it is effective in that, that ticking time bomb scenario. Can I just say, it's very unfortunate in my opinion because, you know, maybe I'm disappointing some of you who think I'm sort of far more supportive of this stuff. I think the ticking time bomb scenario is utterly irrelevant. It's it just something that law professors do. I think it's useless to debate torture because I, I think we cannot do it as a, as a sort of civilized society. But using that misdirection, we've gotten to the point where, I repeat what I said, we are at a point where we cannot use any aggressive techniques, even at the level of aggression used in interrogation of criminal suspects, We've interrogating our worst enemies, and we've done it almost without any serious reflection upon all what it means. So it's all very sad. Can I uh, just come in on on one of the points that David made about the gold standard of the uh, of the Geneva Conventions? Because I think it's a little bit unfair. Uh, it is true that the Geneva Conventions provide to POWs the musical instruments and scientific instruments and the right to uh, be in touch with their broker. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> to manage their affairs uh, back at the home and get tobacco and so forth, which is bad for you now. Uh, but uh, these, uh, and, and these provisions are quaint. But there are other provisions, and what was unfortunate and I think a little bit disingenuous about the administration's uh, approach to this was that while they said the Geneva Conventions, they used the word quaint or they were out of date and so forth, uh, what they what was never suggested was that actually the provisions that they pre were intending not to follow were not quaint at all. There, there's nothing quaint about Article 3. There's nothing quaint about saying that a judicial decision needs to be in accordance with standards of civilized society. Uh, basically, common Article 3 is, uh, it's, it's not the gold standard in the sense that uh, it uh, is uh, providing people with greater rights than other people uh, get. It's actually providing people with very basic and fundamental and minimal rights. And uh, that was what I, I think I found most disappointing was that this, uh, the idea of pointing to these scientific instruments provisions was actually a bit of a cover for what was what was actually being done was denying people the rights that they have under our common Article 3. Let's, um, <laughs> so, uh, we've got about a little <laughs> under a half an hour in this session, so I would like to open it up to the floor for comments and questions. And I believe, Susan, there's a microphone. Oh, thank you, Kater. Um The gentleman, uh, just, yes. Please, if speakers could please identify themselves. Yes, uh, my name is Heather Malik. Uh, I'm an intern here in the Leadership Project, the Wilson Center. My question is to all the uh, uh, um, experts on the panel, uh, opinion on outsourcing torture. We've heard a lot about it in the media. Uh, the legal issues behind it, the policy issues behind outsourcing uh, these um, illegal CIA prisons, for example, that were mentioned. and. Uh, yeah, I would really like uh, Mr. Ripkin to uh, to talk about that, and then um, if, if if that is one way of um, going around the moral absoluteness that you talk about, and the inability of the CIA and the U.S. military to uh, conduct any kind of coercive techniques, so where does I mean the legal background and the policy background behind outsourcing? torture, and if it's effective or not. The, the rendition issue, yeah. I, David, uh, you started very, with very, easy, very easy answer. I've actually written about it quite a bit. We need to distinguish between rendition, which is nothing more than a, a form of process, where you transfer one person from one country to another where he or she is wanted without going for formal extradition process. Uh, and you have other procedures like deportation or extradition, or you can lure people in under false pretenses. As a matter of process, there's nothing exceptional about rendition. It's been used long before September 11. It's been used in case of Carlos the Jackal. So rendition is, is legal. Sending somebody to be tortured 
is obviously illegal under the torture convention and customary international law. But again, I emphasize the point about rendition because I'm frankly sick and tired of people commingling the two. If you get somebody to be tortured in another country, if you, without rendition, if you lure that person in, you know, they sometimes cops do is you send you a flyer saying you want a million dollars to round up some people on the lamb. So if you lure somebody to a country where he'll be tortured for that means, it's not rendition, but it would still be illegal. So it's absolutely illegal if it is torture. What is not illegal is sending people to countries which have bad human rights record, provided you obtain adequate assurances that uh, they will be treated differently. Uh, the reason I know that to be the case is because a lot of our European friends do that. There are a number of decisions by various European courts, including fairly recent decisions by British courts, that say that it's okay to send people to Algeria, to deport people against their will to Algeria because of arrangements reached by Mr. Blair and, M and Mr. Boutafika, who I believe is the president of Algeria, about a year and a half ago. So, um, now, last thing I would say, of course you cannot be blind and deaf if you worked out arrangements with a country, and I don't want to name countries, but you can come up with this thing. And they lied the first time, and they lied the second time, and they lied the third time, Probably the fourth time you're working out that arrangement, you would be pretty, <laughs> on pretty shaky ground relying on it. And I'm here on the notion that just because it's a country with a bad human rights record, you cannot rely on, on these arrangements, is is also not true. If I could, if I could just elaborate, th th this is not an issue uh, uh, that is uh, new, e even. Uh, here, it, it is constantly suggest, uh, brought up in criminal cases where you are uh, uh, sending people to Mexico, for example. They're, 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 uh, they, uh, uh, the suggestion that the person, if he is uh, returned to Mexico to stand trial on a criminal charge, uh, often raises the possibility that he will be tortured. And uh, there is a process through which the State Department always looks into this, and that process has been used also with respect to uh, some of the people in Guantanamo, specifically the uh, Uyghurs uh, from China, uh, who uh, we uh, uh, declined to send back to uh, China because of a determination that there was a likelihood that if they were sent there that they would be abused, uh, and uh, our, our laws uh, prohibit that, and so they were not sent back there. So, uh, it, it uh, at least at that level, uh, there has been uh, an, a very close attention to the possibility, as there always in, is in criminal cases, uh, that uh, there might be torture if the issue is raised. It is looked into. We have people who go and talk to the government. We assess their credibility as to the assurances they get. Sometimes you get additional assurances that uh, a uh, uh, that an international, uh, that a, uh, a human rights organization or a, uh, some third party will be able to go and check on the person every month to see how they're doing uh, and so forth. And so all of these things uh, actually have a fairly long uh, history uh, uh, and uh, uh, qu there's quite a lot of, uh, of uh, experience uh, in that field and I, I think that uh, sir, that uh, wherever it has been brought up in connection with the uh, people in Guantanamo that it's been very carefully reviewed. Uh, there, there may be other cases where, where uh, it has not been uh, done correctly but the policy I think is very clear. Thank you. Woman in the back of the auditorium. Um, my name's Amrit Singh. I'm actually on the next panel. Oh, I'm yes. an attorney at the ACLU's Immigrants' Rights Project. Uh, Mr. Rivkin, I found it very um, interesting that you thought that the ticking time bomb hypothetical was actually uh, not that helpful in informing ongoing, um, the ongoing debate about torture. But what I found particularly disturbing about your account is that it too is uh, an account, the, uh, at least an account of the, the, the legal limitations on, on permissible interrogation techniques. Your account is entirely divorced from what the facts are. Um, and you're very selective about what you choose to present to this audience about you know, what works and what doesn't. And <coughs> I'd just like to draw your attention to the fact that numerous do government documents have been released under the Freedom of Information Act that show that torture did occur, that it occurred not, perhaps not in Guantanamo as you would define it, but it certainly occurred in Iraq and Afghanistan. We have documents which I plan to show to this audience 
in the next panel, which, have, which are autopsy reports showing that um, detainees in Bagram, detainees in Iraq and Abu Ghraib and elsewhere were asphyxiated to death. And we have another document in particular that talks about how authorized interrogation techniques such as SEER techniques, these are, I believe these are the, the techniques you were referring to as the resistance techniques that are taught to uh, army officers, uh, that there are documents that show that these so-called resistance techniques were applied to detainees in Iraq in an offensive, in, you know, not in offensive, but an offensive manner such that uh, individuals were asphyxiated to death using what is known as a close confinement SEER technique. So I think that, and, and I actually, I think none of the panelists uh, address the reality on the ground. It, it doesn't matter in the end what you think torture is or what it isn't. The fact is when you abandon four decades of laws governing what people can and can't do in treating detainees, uh, you, you essentially open the door to still you know, to worse variations of what you've authorized. And that, I think, is a fact that has been uh, brought out very clearly by the Navy General Counsel, Alberto Mora. It's, I'm not an expert myself on Army issues, but I think that, there, that, that you have to, the debate has to be informed by the facts on the ground. I agree with you, and I actually appreciate the question. I at least give me a chance to get very briefly my two cents in. What, uh, what the question just articulated is probably the most intellectually elegant and nuanced objection to this. Let me say two things. First of all, what are the facts on the ground? I absolutely agree with you that there is evidence suggesting that individuals have been treated cruelly, inhumanely, tortured, and in some instances killed. And that occurred in Afghanistan, that occurred in Iraq, and probably for all we know in other places. I am not unaware of it at all. Having said that, let me also, we have to put things in context because with all due respect, Unless you put things in context, you don't learn anything. I mean, if you're dealing with a corporate misbehavior, if you're dealing with governmental misbehavior, to say there's sexual harassment going on, there's violation of securities laws or, or worker safety standards, you have to say, yes, but how does it compare with historical baseline? Are things getting better? Are things getting worse? If things are getting worse, then you need to ratchet down the standards. You need to tighten enforcement procedures. If things are getting better, not a reason to rest in your laurels because hopefully you want to drive it down as the incidence of aberrant behavior as low as possible, but it's not a reason to pull your hair out. I would tell you statistics are hard to come by, but I think that relative to it, and this is borne upon many discussions with colleagues and, and, and others in the Defense Department and other places, relative to experience in other wars, uh, we have the lowest ratio, and this is again, you have to norm it statistically to the number of troops in the field to the number of detainees. We have the best record of any war in which the United States has been involved. Better than the Civil War, better than in World War I, better than in World War II, certainly better than in Vietnam and Korea. Of mistreatment of prisoners, of killing of civilians, of torturing people. A. B. Our record of, of identifying those people early and punishing them, not perfect, but also better than in any war before. So I don't buy the factual premise that there is this horrible problem that, that's festering out there. And again, I think we've been dealing with this very, very effectively. Now, your other point is more conceptual. Look, the safest posture is to ban everything. And there, because there's a, some people call it migration, how it migrated from one place to another. And you know what? I will shock you by saying you're absolutely right. The safest posture in terms of no migration is to have 100% ironclad, no corrosion in any way, form, or shape wouldn't guarantee perfect compliance because let me tell you, back in my Justice Department days, I, I had an unpleasant task of going and visiting a few federal correctional facilities because there were complaints against Bureau of Prisons. My general impression, I hope there's nobody here is a prison warden, but my general impression is there's no prison facility in the world, civilian for that matter, certainly in the United States federal or state, where bad things don't happen to prisoners because some prison guards leaving other prisoners aside, unfortunately, are sadistic bastards, not much better than the people they guard. And they sodomize prisoners, they kill prisoners, they torture prisoners. Incidentally, completely against policy, there's absolutely no policy in prison regulations that allows you to, to do that. But those things happen. So even total abolition wouldn't give you zero aberrant conduct. But I would submit you're right. If you had total abolition of all coercion, it would be safest as far as 
no migration. But are we, can, I, can we not do better as a society? Can we not say, look, particularly in the military, where ladies and gentlemen, nuanced compliance with routines is the order of a day, where we have people who know when to use live ammunition and then not to. What do you do in training versus what you do in combat? How you fight uh, in, a, in a situation where enemy is intermixed with civilians versus fighting in a situation <coughs> where you only have enemy soldiers. The military lives for these kinds of nuanced compliance procedures where context specific. I submit to you that we should be able to come up with some balance. They have modest degrees of coercion, very modest. I'm not you know, holding a candle here for waterboarding, but I would at least invite the audience to the extent that you know, you, you're going to be talking about it to, again, look at the facts, put them in their proper historical perspective, and look at the balancing involved and ask ourselves, do we just have zero of every, every degree of coercion, or can we come up with something and try to hold the line on that? Thank you. Um, yes, uh, the woman, the microphone's coming to you. Thank you. I have a legal question for Identify Mr. yourself, ah, please. Sorry. Christina Cern, I work for the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights at the Organization of American States. I have a legal question for Mr. Taft and a policy question for Mr. Rifkin. Um, Article 3 of the Geneva Conventions is generally in the field considered a mini human rights convention. And the U.S. under Ronald Reagan finally did ratify the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights of the United Nations, which is applicable, again, this is uh, the conviction of human rights advocates, it is applicable both in wartime and in peacetime. So. Um, Mr. Rifkin's notion that there is a legal black hole that some people fall into, that they're not covered by any law, is challenged by this uh, generally common belief in the field of international law. My question for Mr. Taft is, under the convention, under the covenant, um, a state can derogate during a time of state of emergency from certain rights under that treaty. The U.S. declared a state of emergency around the time of 9-11, why didn't it file a formal derogation with the UN Human Rights Committee or the relevant body? And is that state of emergency still in force? For Mr. Rifkin, um, assuming that your general proposition that uh, coercion or torture, however you choose to call it, does work, um, of five years of using these practices on supposedly some uh, unknown number of detainees. There, the estimates are something like 17,000 detainees being held by U.S. forces today in Iraq, some almost 400 in Guantanamo, and some 700 in Afghanistan. What is the nature of the information that we have received from these detainees? Is there any great information coup that the administration can point to uh, I know you're not a member of the administration, so it's putting you in a way in an uncomfortable seat, but you seem to be very well informed. Um, and uh, why haven't we caught Osama bin Laden, for example? <laughs> I guess I, uh, I'm first. On the ICCPR, uh, my, uh, I've been away from this for a while, but my, my recollection is that the government position is that it doesn't apply outside the United States. Uh, this has been rejected, this view has been rejected, I know, by some of the international courts which have considered the question and the, uh, the uh, uh, people who uh, review the operation of the ICCPR, but uh, it remains the U.S. government view, and I think that is the reason why there has not been any derogation uh, filed. Uh, <clears throat> I certainly agree with Will on this and, and not to have a epistemological debate here, but I'm not sure that um, the covenant applies at a time of armed conflict and is formally governed by Geneva. There's a concept of lex specialis in international law. It's not a question of legal black holes. It's a question of what body of law applies. I, I'm a traditional fellow. I happen to believe that in time of armed conflict, which is a term of art. It's not emergency. It's not unpleasantness uh, like a Norman island. But a time of violence reaches a certain threshold level, Geneva Conventions govern, and, and instruments of international humanitarian law do not. 
just because it would be a crazy mismatch, speaking as a lawyer, if you have two different regulatory scheme of different definitions applies. It would be uh, very difficult to establish compliance. As to your policy question, look, uh, first of all, I never suggested that there should be a, uh, 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 it's frequently banded about some law-free zone. Uh, uh, international laws of war are not limited to the Geneva Conventions of 1949 or Protocol 2, 1 and 2 edition of, of 77. There are predecessor Geneva Conventions, there's Hague regulations, there's, you know, tons of other stuff. It's sort of silly to me to, to say, well, because David Rifkin says the Geneva Conventions don't apply to Al-Qaeda, Al-Qaeda is in a, in a legal free zone. That's far from it. As to, uh, as to the effectiveness of interrogations, look, I, even if I were a member of administration, I wouldn't be able to say that. But all I can tell you is this. Oh, incidentally, one thing, uh, not to be personal, I do resent when people say well, whatever you call it, torture, or whatever you call it. I've said three times, and I always say it when I talk about those things. I do not support torture. I do not condone torture. I think torture is absolutely impermissible as a matter of law and torture is indefensible as a matter of ethics. I'm talking about degrees of coercion that fall way short of torture, way short, short of cruel and humane and degrading treatment. Okay? If you hold otherwise, we must be torturing our own soldiers, we must be torturing criminal suspects in, in every police station in America. I'm talking about that level of coercion. But as to, you know, by every account proffered by some very unsympathetic observers in the media, there have been a number of intelligence breakthroughs a number of attacks have been, have been stopped. Now, as always in life, it's very difficult to get a perfect grid in this for obvious reasons because you don't want to tell the bad guys what you've learned, but also because things are clear cut. One of the things about the business of intelligence, which I know is something about having at least been a consumer of intelligence products, it's not black or white. It's not that you ever know something perfectly or you don't. There are degrees, there are gradations. And even if you ask people on the inside how much this particular interrogation or that particular interrogation contributed, you don't know. But you do know one thing, that having information is better than not having information. And these interrogations do produce information. And all things being equal, it is invaluable. Another thing to, to, to state the obvious, we're dealing with an enemy where most of the traditional intelligence gathering techniques, national technical means of collection, are utterly irrelevant because these people do not operate the way the Soviet Union did. You know, they don't send signals that we can, you know, intercept and eventually decrypt. They do not, we don't have moles, unfortunately, penetrating Al-Qaeda the way, you know, we don't have many. One of the great reasons we won the Cold War is because the, the system was so rotten is because every other day you would have a defector <coughs> coming in or somebody who's willing to work in place and, and tell you. Some of them are not genuine, of course. We don't have many such people. The only business, the only game we have is interrogating people we capture. And if we don't interrogate people we capture, our intelligence take, and, and, and if we don't talk to other people who interrogate them because the, our intelligence services may do bad things and it's tainted, but our intelligence take, ladies and gentlemen, would be big fat zero. That's not a way to fight a war. Gentleman in the front row. Right here, Susan. Uh, Matt Rajansky from the Partnership for Secure America. Um, this, this is uh, both a question and a comment for Mr. Rifkin and Mr. Taft. Uh, it seems to me that in your analysis there's a common theme, and that is one of consistency uh, by analogy. In your case, Mr. Rifkin, it's by analogy to uh, either convicted prisoners or suspects uh, in, in civilian custody crimes and so on. Uh, as well as, as trainees in the U.S. military context. Uh, in your case, Mr. Taft, it's comparison to both our expectation of treatment of American personnel who are captured abroad and, in general, the standards set out by international humanitarian law. And the arguments cut in opposite directions. Um, in, in your case, Mr. Taft, the argument is we've set out standards in the Army Field Manual for how we expect our folks to be treated you know, it seems reasonable that we should treat people that we capture in that way. And then the same sort of reasoning, in your case, Mr. Rifkin would argue, well, if we're already doing these things to people that we've picked up for shoplifting or whatever it is, why can't we do them to people we're picking up for suspicion of terrorism uh, and who hold valuable information? And I guess my question is, uh, why does that comparison matter at all? Isn't this an entirely different category? From the standpoint of international humanitarian law, uh, I believe Mr. Rifkin made the point, this is not a state-to-state -state relation kind of system. This is a relationship with 
non-state actors, with individuals, and yet, at the same time, those individuals fall completely outside the traditional law enforcement categories. And so this is really a, an entirely third category, perhaps in between, perhaps in a completely different place from the two, the two that you've set up. So I wonder if you could respond to that. Uh, very briefly, because mine is really brief. Um, you, uh, you, uh, thank you for giving me a chance to make it a little crisper. B remember, my view is that legal issues do not drive a policy here. It is the policy choices driven by policy. To the extent, because you're absolutely right, uh, Geneva Conventions and various other things do not <coughs> drive the conduct vis-a-vis -vis criminal suspects the way they do vis-a-vis -vis individuals uh, involved in an armed conflict, for example. But if you assume with legal issues that the legal envelope is here and the policy envelope is here, the reason I adduced facts about how we treat criminal suspects or prisoners or individuals in training is because they tell us how we as a society co comfortable with balancing considerations of effectiveness, considerations of perceived utility, and considerations of compassion. And in that moral universe, the comparison is apropos. If we as a society are comfortable subjecting our young men and women who volunteer for the military to certain degrees of coercion to toughen them up, if we made the choice as a body polity, I think it would be ludicrous not to say that that's relevant to how we make a moral choice with regard to our enemies. Legally, you're right, it's irrelevant. But again, my legal box is here. The policy box is more narrow. That's why. Um, let, let me uh, uh, just take one one example uh, as a uh, that I think is responds to your your or is, relates to your point. Uh, David and I were up uh, was it last week or the week before? Week before uh, on the issue of uh, whether habeas corpus rights should be extended to the people in Guantanamo. Uh, this is a heavy constitutional question, uh, but. I, I think we uh, we both agreed that probably uh, constitutionally it's not required. Uh, well, the Supreme Court will decide this, but uh, my guess is that it, that it, uh, that uh, it is not uh, uh, that the habeas corpus right does not extend there uh, to uh, as a matter of constitution, uh, as a matter of statute. It did before, or so the Supreme Court held by uh, I guess it was. Uh, five to three, uh, but uh, would have been five to four if you took Justice Robert, Chief Justice Roberts' vote below. Uh, and uh, the question there uh, suggested to me that, and the administration often says this, and I think it's obvious that we are dealing in a different, in a third place uh, in this uh, situation. This is not quite the typical war and it's not the uh, typical law enforcement uh, model uh, that we're used to, uh, which was, for me, uh, actually why it made sense as a policy matter to leave in place the habeas corpus right that these people in Guantanamo had, which normally prisons of prisoners of war do not have, uh, no matter where they are. But this war is a little different, and what's happening in Guantanamo uh, is uh, a, you're dealing with people, first of all, who happen to be uh, volunteers individually. There, there is some individual responsibility that a person has uh, for joining al-Qaeda more than being drafted into the Japanese army. Uh, and so in that sense, this person is a little bit more like a criminal with an individual responsibility for where he is and what he's doing and also his punishment looks a little bit more like a criminal punishment, or, or his situation, I should say, looks more like a criminal punishment because the internment of a POW is not a punishment. It's uh, something else. Uh, and uh, it seemed to me to be a, a very sensible thing in that situation to put the habeas corpus, leave the habeas corpus right there, so just simply to be able to determine that we actually have the right people. Uh, we should be creative, uh, not just in uh, using this new situation to justify uh, uh, things that are to the disadvantage of the other uh, uh, of the uh, people who are being detained, uh, but it seems to me, in some instances, 
we should be willing to say, hey, uh, we'll maybe have a slightly different approach here than what we would have in the law of war that'll be somewhat to their advantage. Uh, and uh, that seemed to me to be a, a place where we could do that to our benefit that would make sure that we really do have the right people there uh, and uh, to add legitimacy to their detention. But, Seth, do you want to comment? I was just going to add the, the perspective that we haven't really addressed of, of the military and the military lawyers and particularly, I mean, I was struck um, in 2006 last year when you spoke or heard the testimony of current and former military lawyers, how <coughs> deeply, deeply concerned they are about the issue of reciprocity. And for them, it's not a theoretical issue. I mean, they are really worried about what happens when U.S. servicemen are captured overseas, whether by a traditional country or by an irregular force like al-Qaeda al or, or in Iraq. And, and they are really deeply concerned about creating new categories or, or trying to treat this differently and abandoning the structure that's been in place. So I think that's important. I mean, they're, they're not looking at it from a political perspective or some, some sort of... Um, theoretical, it's a very practical perspective, and that's, and that's their take on it. Can I just say one thing, and I and not to sound harsh, Seth, because I know that's where the Jags are, and I've debated a number of them on this, but that argument doesn't hold water. We should be doing things, we shouldn't deviate beyond a certain level because of a right thing to do. I agree with the critics in that respect. The notion of reciprocity is bogus. American prisoners have been mistreated in every damn war since Geneva Conventions have been promulgated. They've been horribly mistreated in Korea. If you look at the stats, something like 60% of people perish from maltreatment and, and torture. And, and uh, if you look at Vietnam, it was a little better, but not much. But in this war, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> the notion that there's going to be any reciprocity, every soldier, virtually every American service personnel and some civilians who've been captured by the bad guys have been tortured too horribly to, to even discuss uh, in levels of brutality that is truly medieval. So, I mean, that's nonsense. We're not dealing with people who are going to be in any way swayed by reciprocity. doesn't mean that everything goes, but uh, I just don't understand this argument. And I've never heard any good answer from any Army, Air Force, or, or Navy, or Marine Jags. They, they just, they, they don't have an answer because there ain't an answer to this. We're just out of time, but I wanted to give Cindy Aronson uh, 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 the last question or comment. Great. Thanks. Cindy Aronson from the Woodrow Wilson Center. I actually have a question for Seth, um, which has to do with... Uh, About time. Really. <laughs> 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 um, <laughs> we'll be hearing um, from some representatives of organizations in civil society in the second panel, um, but you did mention in, in your comments um, the, uh, the presidential debate among the candidates in which uh, people with the exception of Senator McCain, were um, uh, refraining from taking a strong stand against this. And I was wondering if you could um, tell us a little bit more about the nature of the influences on members of Congress as they were um, debating um, these laws in 2005 and 2006, and whether there was a sense that public opinion uh, was on one side or another, or whether there were groups equally mobilized um, in favor of uh, the, the kinds of um, policies and, and, and uh, issues that, that Mr. Rifkin has been talking about, um, or whether the, most of the um, advocacy was on, on, on the part of um, uh, organizations that opposed uh, the, um, uh, what were perceived as U.S. accesses. I think the, the politics of it were that the sense is that the public doesn't like torture, that they're uneasy, with torture, and that seems to be pretty widespread. But there's also a, a fear among Democrats about appearing weak on defense or not giving the military all the tools they need. And I think when the vote happened, it was October, uh, mid-October. The election was just a couple weeks away last year when, they, when the Military Commissions Act came up. And they were real close to getting back those majorities. And I don't think there was a sense, well, one, I don't think they had the votes but two, I don't think many Democrats saw a lot to gain from pressing the issue, from going to the, to the mat, you know, trying to filibuster and that sort of thing. I just don't, you didn't get a sense that they saw a lot of political gain in that. Going forward, in, you don't see many of the Democratic presidential contenders so far making a big issue out of this. So I think there's a sense that the public doesn't like torture but you also want to give them all the tools that are legally possible 
And so that puts the Democrats in something of a bind uh, and, and doesn't make this issue a real strong one for them. That concludes this panel. Uh, we'll take a break till 11 a.m. Uh, when we will reconvene for panel two. Please join me in thanking our Thank presenters for a stimulating presentation. Right, we got a quick, quick, quick time, but I usually get a quick time on this. Okay. Thank you very much. Now, this uh, encounter. Time to do it. We don't, uh, we're not encouraged to take strong positions. Mr. David, we're, 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 we're just Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.